Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the last day of the Solstice Spirit Summit. My name is Marissa Lovett, and I'm going to be talking about the Hamingya, the Old Norse Lux Soul. And so um, I'm going to basically get into this in a few minutes, but the main thing I want to do is just kind of talk for a few minutes about like sort of what this is sort of going to be all about. So I'm going to go ahead and ask for some help. So let me make sure I can see comments. Can anyone hear me or see me? Oh, good. Yay, you can hear me. Awesome. <laughs> okay. So, um, as I said, my name is Marissa Lovett. I have a business called Celestial Tree. I do shamanic coaching and um, I basically teach people um, how to dream, heal, and basically follow their spirit helpers for a better life. I've been a shamanic practitioner for 20 years and I've been a coach for about four years now. Hi, Christina. Thank you. <laughs> for a moment, I thought, I hope people can hear me. So I'm going to be looking uh, down a little bit because there are some notes because some of this is complicated. But um, I'm basically going to teach and speak today about um, a, an ancestral soul energy called the Hamingya, which is an Old Norse word. I'm going to talk about how the soul energy functions how spirit beings connect with this energy to weave the future and the types of healing work that can help um, restore this luck soul if it's lost. And there are many sources for soul energies um, in most animistic cultures. And, you know, if it's a shamanic culture or earth based, it's probably animistic. There are soul energies that come from different places and go different places after the person dies. So there's like a vital soul. There could be like an animal guardian soul. There can be a soul passed down from the ancestors. Um, there's like all these different kinds of souls. And these combined, well, they're basically like soul energies and they combine to make what we would call a soul. But they're actually kind of like different pieces of the same pattern. And it's important to know about them because if you're doing healing work or ritual work, it helps to know what you're dealing with. Um, let me see. Uh, this is interesting. Thank you. So these soul energies combine to create a living human being, and then they are released in different places after death and recycled into new human beings. So I'm going to be talking about the Hamingya in a way that may contradict things that scholars say, but if I do, I will, um, I'll back it up with an example, either from my own experiences or something from another culture. So one of these energies that can be passed down to a person is a success energy or luck energy. This energy comes from very successful people, like a very successful ancestor, and then goes after the, the person dies to be with one of the descendants. Hamingya is also a little different in the fact that a very powerful person can actually lend their Hamingya to another person that is not a descendant. Um, and this can be like sort of a part, like a temporary thing. And also it functions in the same way that like a power animal functions in the sense that you can journey with it. So it's kind of a complicated idea, but it's a, I think it's a really cool idea. And I hope that this is something that you can use to empower you yourself and make your life more powerful. So um, people draw on the mythology and epic poetry of the early Germanic and Scandinavian cultures in order to understand these pre-Christian traditions and maybe what they were thinking and feeling. Now, fortunately, some of these ideas are still around in places like Iceland and other places, so they haven't completely left the culture. Um, now, sometimes this mythology, and I, I just need to get this part out of the way, Sometimes this mythology has been misused. Um, it's been misused by white supremacists and it's been misused specifically by the Nazis in the most 
dramatic and painful way. Um, it's not only wrong, this is actually inaccurate because there's a lot of evidence that the Viking Age Scandinavians were very eclectic people. If you lived like them and believed the things they believed, you were, a, you were one of them. So like what I, what, the reason I'm saying this is because there are graves that have been excavated and they've checked the DNA of the people and the DNA of the people is from all over the places, excuse me, all over the place. But they're basically buried with these Viking artifacts or Viking era artifacts. I love that you're bringing up the misuse of mythology and Nordic cosmology. Thank you, Kirsten. Glad to catch this one. Thank you for bringing forth your wisdom. Oh, thank you. Um, and I just want to say that anything I mentioned about ancestry from this mythology applies to anybody. We all have ancestors. So you have a luck soul, just like everybody else. It's about time this comes more into the light. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pause for a minute and I'm going to um, light this candle. It's carved with runes that I associate with the Hamingya. Now, there is not an official rune that's associated with this Lux soul. Some people associate it with Fehu because Fehu has to do with prosperity and that means success. Um, I associate it with the rune Othala, which has to do with ancestors and Algis, which is one of the words for the protection room. So as I'm burning this candle, I just want to take a moment and just invite you, if you're in a place that's safe and you're not driving or something like that, to just close your eyes for a minute. And we're going to call on your most protective and most powerful ancestral or other spirit. So whoever you trust the most, guardian angel, deity, an animal spirit, your ancestors, whoever. And with this being, sourcing from this being, I want to invite you to ask this being to let go of any foreign energy or any negative energy to let it not be in your body and not in your field. It can be anywhere else in the universe. And we're going to ask that all the doors that need to be closed be closed and all the doors that need to be open be open. And we're going to ask that the energies of the ancestors who most love you to be a little closer, the most well ones, the most empowered ones, the ones who have crossed over. We'll just ask them to be a little closer. And you may feel a little bit more solidly connected to the earth, to the ancestors of the land, which we thank and to the star nation and to the stellar ancestors above. And we just ask for you to get a sense that your gifts your ability to create success, your protection, your power, and your courage, all are flowing from you, to you, from your most successful ancestors. This energy is with you all the time. But I just ask that it be a little more available at this time. And when you're ready, just open your eyes.
And after I get done meditating or connecting, I like to put my hands over my heart. So I'm going to talk now, this is kind of the boring part. I'm going to talk a little bit about the spirit beings that a person may contact. These are spirit beings from Germanic and Scandinavian cultures, but they have corollaries in many, many different cultures. So I'm just talking about them from the Germanic and Scandinavian point of view. So many people have heard of the Norns. These are the three sort of fate goddesses that live at the base of the world tree called Yggdrasil. And they either spin and weave a person's destiny or they carve a person's destiny in runes on the base of the tree. Now, some people have thought that this means that your fate is fixed, but that's not exactly how I believe or other practitioners believe that the Germanic or Scandinavian traditions see this. Certain aspects are, but um, there's also a belief that we're weaving our future at all times. And so knowledge about the Norns and some of these other spirit beings is really helpful to weave the best future. Oh, I need the refresher. Awesome. <laughs> Hi, Rebecca. Thank you for watching. So um, I spent the last year studying um, about the art of Sather, which is um, sort of like a Scandinavian Germanic shamanism. And there are um, women who are sort of witches within that tradition called wolves. And the art of the vulva is not just about predicting the future, even though some of these women are very famous seers and their predictions are very accurate. But it's about really understanding the pattern, the entire pattern of a person's life and being able to use magic or ritual to reweave that pattern if something is off. And people inherit very beautiful things from their ancestors, but they inherit trouble from their ancestors as well. And so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about how that fits into this Scandinavian and Germanic idea of the Hamingya. So there's also an idea that babies are reborn as the ancestors. And so, and I mean, excuse me, the other way around, the ancestors are reborn as babies. And sometimes um, Hamingya can be connected to this rebirth process, as well as other ancestral soul energies that I'm gonna talk a little bit about. Now, the soul energy called the Hamingya can appear as a woman, it can, can uh, appear as an animal spirit. It can be used to facilitate shamanic style journey. It also grants protection and it helps a person to achieve status, which in these cultures was incredibly important because your status had a lot to do with whether you survived or not. But mainly it helps a person to find the happiness that they feel when they're using the gifts that they inherited from their ancestors. And this is, um, I think, right in uh, maybe Iceland, Hamingya basically means happiness. So there's this idea that like working with your luck and your success is, is supposed to bring you happiness. So there's another idea, which is fate. Now, as I've said, fate often gets represented in the Scandinavian traditions as being fixed, like every single moment of your life is fixed. But there's a lot of... Um, evidence that that's not the way that they saw the world a, a thousand years ago, and certainly people don't see that now. So the ancestral part of fate is called Urlag, and it's very close to the idea of Dharma in Sanskrit. So it means primal law. And so it, you can have inherited trauma or cultural grief. This is a type of like shadowy Urlag. Inherited strengths and weaknesses are another. Um, ghost energy, this is unresolved issues held by the ancestors or like curse-like energies or like bindings or things like that. That's also, it can be wrapped into Orlog. Um, if you get a chance, can you explain the difference between the Filigant and the Hamingya? No hurry. Oh, actually, that's a great question and you must be psychic because I'm going to do that. Um, the second, uh, part of this is that, um, because we're all woven together with one another, Healing Orlog helps others as well as yourself. And it even helps the ancestors and the descendants that are coming. So you're basically healing the entire line. This is basically a similar thing to what Daniel Ford teaches. 
um, with ancestral lineage repair or certain ceremonies where you ancestralize um, um, uh, ancestors, you know, it's any kind of like ancestral repair is healing or luck. Now there's another idea which is called weird or order in Old Norse, and this is also translated as fate. I see this more as an individual's destiny. In some meditations or shamanic journeys, uh, practitioners travel to the Norns at their well at the base of Yggdrasil, and the well is called Urderbrunner, and they visualize fate as a combined weaving with the orlog being the, the strings that come down from the ancestors and go to the descendants. So they're like the lengthwise warp strings. And the, and the weird would be like um, the sideways weft. That's the part that is your individual piece, your individual piece of the weaving. So this way of visualizing allows a person to look for tears, knots, and other patterns in the weave of fate. So if you're looking for like a meditation or a journey that you can do, that's a really common one that people go to sort of look and visualize how these two forces are working together. Okay, now some researchers and they're very famous ones associate this hamingya soul part because of its appearance as a woman or an animal. It can be associated with another soul part called the filgya. This is really complicated because the filgya is passed down from the ancestors, the sacred grandmothers. It's an animal form or a person. It allows a person to shamanic journey. It gives protection and it gives a certain amount of power. However, I believe that these are two separate soul essence energies that sometimes work together um, as a person works. And the reason I believe this is because um, there's a clue in what happens when the person dies using it. Um, the filgya seems to leave after death and go either into the earth or to a descendant. The hamingya does the same thing, but it can also leave and go to another person in life. It, the hamingya seems like it's a much more, um, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a slightly different function and a slightly different pathway of where it goes after death. Uh, 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 the filiga reminds me a little bit of um, Mexican indigenous cultures idea of the Nahual. And in one of those cultures, the Nahual or power animal goes to the uh, underworld after death. It's um, held by the Lord of the animals in a corral, a sacred corral, and then it's assigned to a new person um, in life when the person comes back. Um, the other thing that makes me think this is that one of my teachers um, called on Yorther, the earth, um, to help a person connect with their filgya or power animal. So I think that these soul parts are slightly different, but they do some of the same things. They appear the same thing. And because it's old Norse it's and it's a thousand years ago, it's a little bit complicated. The two souls seem to have different destinations though, and different after death and, and during life. Also, many other factors can influence a person's fate. This is where different types of ancestral soul energies play their part. There are also beings called the Deesir or Dis. These are like the sacred grandmothers. They are ancient sacred grandmothers. They guide an individual or a family, but they're very connected to a family. And there are very important celebrations that were held after the harvest, to the de cedar and before the spring planting, because it wasn't just that they held the luck of the family, they held the success in um, in like growing food, which was absolutely vital because that's how people made a living back then. So there's it there's it's complicated when you read about this stuff because people will talk about good luck and bad luck norns, not just the three norns. Um, they'll talk about the dees. They'll talk about the filgya and they'll talk about hamingya and they're almost like interchangeable parts. So I think they're all working together to make a combined ancestral protective soul energy, but I don't think they're the same thing. Now, sometimes a family's luck spirit would be passed from an ancestor to a descendant during a dream. And so this is why I believe that it's possible to journey to find your hamingya. So here's one from the Icelandic sagas. It is said that Gloom had a dream one night 
in which he seemed to be standing out in front of his dwelling, looking towards the firth, and he thought he saw the form of a woman stalking up straight through the district from the sea towards Vera. She was of such height and size that her shoulders touched the mountains on each side, and he seemed to go out of the homestead to meet her and asked her to come to his house, and then he woke up. This appeared very strange to everyone, but he said, the dream is no doubt a very remarkable one, and I interpret it thus, my grandfather Vigfus must be dead, and that woman who was taller than the mountains must be his guardian spirit, for he too was far beyond other men in honor and in most things, and his spirit must have been looking for a place of rest where I am. So there's some evidence that the Haminya can be encountered in trance states. And I think this is important for those of us now because we don't have really strong ancestral traditions in this culture. And so um, there's a way to sort of intend to connect with this soul essence rather than just, you know, hope that it shows up. Now, I'd like to also talk a little bit about how this soul energy can function in the work shamanic practitioners and animistic ritualists do. And this is based on my own very limited experience. Some of this is going to have to do with um, ancestral work that comes from the actual Germanic and Scandinavian traditions. And some of this is going to come from my experience of working with ancestral healing in other cultures. But it, this um, idea of the Hamingya and the Norse way of looking at the soul has been extremely helpful for me for, to organize some of this and to explain what's happening. So in, um, since the Hamingya is uh, passed down from the ancestors, it's good to be on good terms with them, which includes offerings and respect. This is why um, a lot of the coaching that I do is with people who are having trouble. They've had you know trouble with their families, trouble with their ancestors, and they're having a hard time tuning into the protective power of the ancestors. And I can understand this because I have suffered from this most of my life. And it's something that I continuously have to work on. In fact, right now I'm working, um, I'm receiving healing from an ancestral lineage repair person because um, I've, I've achieved such benefits from, um, from working in this way. So the basic idea of ancestral reverence is just now becoming a mainstream process. Like you're, you're hearing about altars, um, the day of the dead has become more powerful, um, where people are paying attention to Halloween, things like that. But um, this offerings by themselves, if practiced long enough, can begin to heal ancestral trauma and strengthen this soul part. So even if you don't do another thing, Consistently leaving offerings can be a very powerful way of connecting with this soul energy because the soul energy is a gift or a lineage from your most well ancestors. And so more offerings strengthens the bridge between you and them, which means they can bless you more with their soul energy. If you're in a tough spot, a traditional way of doing um, like offerings is to take bread or some kind of baked product and go to a body of water and put little pieces of it in the water. And you're basically like feeding your ancestors. Um, what I like to do is, and I learned this from Latanya Hayward, is um, I like to put some of my breakfast food and well, be breakfast beverage on um, the altar. And for me, that's um, coffee. And um, my ancestors like that. And I found out that some other people with Germanic and Scandinavian ancestors give their ancestors coffee. That's, so I thought that was kind of neat. Um, humming yeah, also means happiness. And so I believe when we follow our unique path and use our gifts, the ancestors and spirit helpers pay attention and support us. Sometimes taking a bold step on my path gets the, attentions of, uh, the attention of these spirits in a powerful way. So in other words, if there's something you really want to do, you really love this, and you want to recruit your Hamingya to help you. Take a bold step. Do something that feels a little bit outside of your comfort zone. And you will recruit the um, positive energy of the ones who love you. Because you're doing, you're making the world a better place for the descendants. And they're very interested in that. Um, so we weave Hamingya into our weird by taking these steps. 
One of these powerful luck drawing practices is also to give back to our communities, which are human and other than human. Generosity to fellow humans is mentioned in all the sagas. Um, people were criticized for not being generous. Like there's this famous poet, Egil Skallagrimsson, and he buried his treasure and like the like poets like kind of like a thousand years ago kind of got after him for it. Um, Scandinavian and Germanic teach teachings also emphasize the importance of powerful uh, nature spirits called the Landvater. Some of these powers are called giants. They're sometimes called trolls or Jotun. Um, some practitioners develop very helpful relationships with these beings, especially if they are called to healing or magical work. Um, I haven't met anyone so far that doesn't have a relationship with one Jotun who is a healer. Um, but many folk traditions emphasize certain offerings or practices that help create good relationships with these beings. So like, for example, um, there's a, a, a woman named Maria Kvilhaug who has a Patreon where she talks about Scandinavian and Norse traditions. And she talks about at Christmas, there's like a special porridge that's made or it's like a special food. And then you go outside and you sing this song and you stamp your feet while you're doing it. And if you do that, you're feeding the spirits. And when you feed the spirits, that means that you'll have good luck for the year and you won't lose things. So, um, and she, she said one time she actually forgot to do it one year and she was looking for something and then she realized she had to go out and do this thing and she did it and then she found it. However, um, and so these are like actions, like ordinary things you can do to weave, um, to improve your weird and to like access the hamingya in a more powerful way. But luck can also abandon a person. And also you can be the kind of person who you take that bold step. You feel that initial rush of support and then all the doubts and confusion come and you're almost like being attacked by unhelpful energies. So how can we recover this relationship? So the, the first step is to develop a relationship with this power animal that Kirsten was talking about yesterday or that is sometimes known as the Nahual in the, um, in the Mesoamerican traditions called the filia. In many cultures, the guardian animal spirit is associated with the ancestors. It's even passed down from the ancestors. Um, it's pretty like mainstream in the Germanic and Scandinavian traditions to believe that it comes from the Dis, the sacred grandmothers, the most ancient sacred grandmothers. Um, so one of the reasons to develop this relationship um, even if you don't do any shamanic journeying is for protection and power. So if you want better luck, it's helpful to have protection and power. Um, I, basically a core shamanic journey that I do every day is um, something called the body protector journey. This comes from Betsy Bergstrom, who is actually uh, part native and it comes from her native ancestors, but it, feels like something that's a very strong way of bonding with the Bilgya. And that is you go down into the lower world, you call on a spirit. It doesn't have to be your guardian animal spirit. It can be another spirit. But this is one that's charged with protecting your body and your things. So after that, you merge with the spirit and you come back up. And what this does is it just puts a little, like a field around you so that like it's just a little easier to hang on to the things that are important to you, including your health and safety. So um, this basically would be um, you're returning uh, to the world that we call Midgardr in the um, Scandinavian traditions with protection. So it's a way of walking with protection in the world. And it comes from this gift from the earth and the ancestors, from the sacred grandmothers. In the Scandinavian and Germanic traditions, various types of merging with animals or animus, animal spirits happen either in dreams or in waking life. Many stories in Norse mythology mention, um, mention this. It's like Kirsten was talking about the berserker guy yesterday. I mean, there's like so many stories about like people merging with animals, being the children of animals, that kind of thing. <clears throat> Another step involves connecting with the sacred grandmothers called the Desir. The Desir are the oldest female ancestors in your line. They watch over the family. That's why they were petitioned with this sacred ceremony after the harvest and before the spring planting. So let me see if somebody has a question. 
Not sure if you already have a video of the body protector journey, but I'd be interested in it. Actually, it's in the Patreon. I haven't organized, um, which I'll be talking about later, but I do have a video of it. So yeah. Um, so basically, um, many, um, the relationship can be very complex. Like if you go into the old stories, there are DC or that get people in trouble and DC or that are protective, but it's generally thought of now that they're protective, that they're kind of like a guardian angel that comes from the grand, the sacred grandmothers. Many practitioners call on their DC or to open sacred space. In fact, there's a way of opening sacred space where you just call on your, um, it's like casting a circle in Wicca, except that you're calling on these sacred grandmothers the whole time. And um, the DC or can appear as a woman. I think sometimes it can appear as an animal also, which kind of lends to that whole like sort of confusion about which soul part is doing what. They are what Daniel Ford would call well ancestors, like really protective, the ones who love you. They are ancestral guides who have fully crossed over to the land of the dead. They are the ones who love us and wish us well. So cultivating a good relationship with them is also helpful in these traditions, which is why, like, if you've ever heard of the Anglo-Saxon festival called Modra Night, it's around the solstice. It's like the day before the solstice. That is um, a sort of, you're asking for the DC or for their help, as well as for your own mother, grandmother, those kinds of people. Also the Norns, who are sometimes called the Dees of the gods, can be consulted. There is a journey where a practitioner can travel to the lower world to meet with the Norns and observe the weave of their lives or the runes that were carved into the world tree, Yggdrasil, at their birth. The Deesir may also be present, the sacred grandmothers. Practitioners can also journey to the land of the dead, Helheim, to meet with ancestors and to seek their advice about repairing their relationship with the Haminya. And this is done. Um, it's not necessary to journey to connect with these beings, but if you want to do ritual work with them, then journeying is very helpful. Hold on for one minute. I have this thing where I can't talk for a half an hour without being better. Okay. One person's hamingya can also positively impact another person. And there's a story about a famous king who did this. Um, he's the king who brought Christianity to Norway. And he basically sends like a somebody like off to do an errand. And the person, and he tells them, you will have my hamingya will protect you. Because powerful people, successful people, were supposed to have this protective power. So that's the idea of success rubbing off. Um, so in some sagas, one person can send their hamingya to help another person. There are Swedish luck in fishing or hunting spells where a person basically prepares to fish. They set up their fishing like rod and all that kind of stuff on the day when the assembly, the thing, and the chief, who is the most powerful person in that area, first appears publicly. Powerful, successful people are thought to have a strong hamingya. So another spell involves stealing hunting luck by walking over the tracks made by another better hunter who's having more success. So in this way, the luck self can be strengthened in a relatively safe way. So um, if you want a more new age enlightened way of doing this, a helpful way to approach this in ritual, which also comes from Daniel Four, is to pray by asking your most helpful, powerful, well spirits or your deceiver to work with or bless another person's helpful, powerful spirits. So in other words, your DCer and their DCer would be talking to each other and working together. In this way, you sort of cut out of the loop any of the harmful energies that could be like throwing sand and things. There are lineage repair healers who specialize in guiding people through this type of work. I've personally experienced lots of just great benefit from um, and guidance after receiving this type of healing. So healing your orlog will make your humming now stronger. But there are other ways to do it that um, you can do yourself. I'm fortunate to have learned a few ancestral lineage repair practices from other traditions like Kurindavismo and the Andean tradition. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes about that. Some of these involve cult 
cross-cultural practices like fire ceremonies. And the nice thing about fire ceremonies is they're pretty cross-cultural in the sense that once you learn one fire ceremony, you can kind of cross it over to another tradition. There, there are differences, but the basic idea is the same. You can do a fire ceremony to a specific lineage that's giving you trouble. Let's say it's your mother's father's lineage. Like you notice you have a pattern that you inherited from them. You can make a fire ceremony to that lineage and you're strengthening the bond between you and the well ancestors, the ones that wish you well. And so they can kind of protect and push away the confounding energies that might be problematic. There's another type of healing process where you basically, um, this is from Corinderismo, where you release um, with the help of powerful deities, cords that connect you to unhappy ancestors. Once these, what they're, what is called harm cords are released, the person has a much stronger um, connection to their, this luck self. Things flow for them and it's easier for them to be happy and to be their true self. You are so knowledgeable. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and, and that's something that you need another person to do for you, but, um, or, or you can learn to do it yourself, um, but it's, it's basically that kind of idea. So that when the person um, begins to really experience the protection and happiness, they make choices that matter to them. They make better choices. And it's easier to weave the weird in a good way. So there's a third way of doing this. And this really does have to be done with a shamanic pr practitioner. And that is the shaman journeys back in time to when an ancestor did something that was problematic. And they heal the line. They heal everything that happened then. They heal the people. They create a new future where, I mean, a new present where the bad thing doesn't happen, which makes a, a new future for the descendant. You can lift curses this way. The entire line heals. And um, and it, it helps if you're going to do this work, it helps to do this with a practitioner who can at least hold space for you. Because there are some heavy energies that are associated with the ancestors. The ancestors are beautiful and wonderful, but they can also be, there can be problematic energies. So as these spirit helpers do their work, the present changes for the descendants. And sometimes this will happen to like all the members of the family simultaneously, which is pretty cool. So I have one more sort of um, story to talk about, and that is doing this work within the Scandinavian and Germanic traditions themselves. There are powerful beings in the Nordic and Germanic paths who specialize in some of this work. So even though a lot of the traditions were lost a thousand years ago, they weren't completely lost. And some of them survive in folk magic and other things. So it's possible to begin to work within this tradition. So shamanic healing with the Jotun, the giants or trolls can be very powerful. I was introduced to one of these Jotun who has a little bit of a relationship with the goddess Freya or Freya, depending on how you say it. Her name is Hindla. And she's uh, mentioned in a poem with the goddess Freya called Hindlajot. She seems to specialize in knowledge about the ancestors. She can help people find their ancestors. She's good at like sort of genetic stuff and any kind of like ancestral trouble. Um, she has assisted in types of healings where knowledge of the ancestors is needed. And I believe she is a powerful spirit helper um, who can help repair or diagnose issues with this Luxol energy. Everyone doesn't agree that she's a healer, but everyone seems to agree that she's um, in a divination journey, she's invaluable. Oh, I would love to do that. Do you assist people with this? Um, some of this, yes, some of this I do. Yes, that's part of the coaching work I do. Thank you. Um, in one healing, I made a divination journey to understand how to approach a healing work, which is just something you do when you do shamanic healing, you do a divination journey first. So I journeyed um, with my spirit helpers to, um, to speak with an ancient female ancestor who wanted to come with me on this divination journey. We went, we wound up going to um, a part of the world tree where the giants are, where the trolls are. And we found this, troll or Jotun named Hindla. She basically took um, this ancestor out flying around the other world, looking for ancestor, for answers, excuse me, to my questions about the client. 
So then she communicated that I needed to make um, some more offerings and that I needed to make a rune reading. The rune reading uh, basically communicated some of what I needed to do. I needed to do um, a thing called an extraction. But then also she said that I needed to make an extra offering to this Jotun um, de, uh, being named Hindla. So during the healing, Hindla helped identify an ancestral issue that was holding this person back. She also was a calming influence as other spirits did the healing work. Eventually, the actual healing work was done primarily by these sacred grandmothers, the Desir. So that's just a little bit of an idea about how all of this can work together, even within the Germanic traditions where so much has been lost. It's still possible, excuse me, to do this work um, and to return people's ancestral lines to a much more healed state with the help of these powerful spirit helpers. And it's possible to, um, by cultivating a relationship to work on your own lines or someone else's lines with some ritual safety. And this is important to me because I'm really lucky to have been introduced to many beautiful um, traditions from other cultures and they're, they've made my life, they've been an incredible blessing. But it's also beautiful to learn some things that my own people did and that might be helpful to people from any tradition. Because as I mentioned before, these teachings are are for everyone, anyone who has ancestors. So let me see if there's anything. Okay, good. Um, so I'm very passionate about what I do. Um, I think that working with this Lux Soul energy is so powerful and wonderful. When these things are flowing, you feel guided, things fall into place. Um, it's harder for bad things to happen to you. Um, it's just really important. You feel like you have a mission, that sort of thing. And in this time when there's so much chaos and there's so much disruptive energy and change and things like that, having the deep roots of connecting with your ancestors and with the luck energy, the success energy that they give you um, can be a real blessing when things feel very shaky. So, excuse me, one more thing. Basically, because I want to um, guide you through this, if you're interested, I've created a free gift, which I will be posting um, after my talk. It's basically a guided journey where you can meet this Jotun Hindla. Um, but you don't have to, um, you're basically meeting an elemental being in the earth who um, wishes you well and can connect you with your ancestors. So if you're not interested in the Germanic and Scandinavian paths, you can still work with this meditation. Um, it's not intended to just um, be for that. And so basically it's a video guided journey and it will help you to experience your humming now. And so all you have to do is enter your name and email address and you'll get it. Now, if you're interested and you want to explore this a little further. I, along with my sister, Kirsten, have a um, basically a Patreon called Shamanic Earth Medicine. And in that Shamanic Earth Medicine, um, we have guided journeys as well as live events, live streams that we do and, and other types of things. And one of them is a journey to the norms if you want to experience um, and the Desir if you want to experience um, visualizing your orlog and weird. Um, another one is the body protector journey that Kirsten mentioned earlier. Um, there are instruction videos about like how to journey if you've never journeyed before. And there's just a lot of other, you know, Kirsten does sacred tobacco and, and, and a lot of work from traditions and things like that. So um, if you feel drawn to this, I'd love to, um, meet you and work with you that way. Um, but the main thing is that I hope that you will take advantage of the free gift and experience your humming ya and just begin to weave this into your ancestral practices. You can also connect with me on um, Facebook. 
I'll, I'll leave these links up. Um, I'm at Celestial Tree. I'm also on Twitter with the same name, on Instagram on the same name, and I have a YouTube channel. So um, let me just see if there are any questions. It sounds amazing. Oh, cool. I'm glad that this touched you. Uh, Christina, thank you so much. Actually, we'll love that gift. Cool. Yeah, because I, I really want, I'm a little bit, um, I follow a Danish man named Runa Rasmussen, who's a, um, he's like a cultural anthropologist, but he's also like an animist and he practices like an African folk, like religion. And he's really passionate about the idea that these Germanic and Scandinavian traditions shouldn't just be left to the white supremacists. Like there are traditions, they belong to anybody who cares about them. And um, they can be, they, there's a lot of wisdom there that can be very helpful. And so I'm hoping that this can blend into whatever you're already doing and be, you know, just bring some more power and energy to your life. So let me see if there's any more questions here. I'll just give people a minute or two. I would listen to you for hours. There's so much to learn. There. Thank you. It was really sweet of you. Thank you. I really love this topic in particular is very close to my heart because um, healing your ancestral lines is so difficult and so challenging that the idea that there are pieces that can be healed, like your hamingya or um, ways that you can shift your own fate or calling on these ancestral spirit helpers can really help to make the process seem a little more doable. And for some people that happens very easily. And for other people like myself, it's a little more challenging. I met you in your YouTube videos. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Okay. So um, if there is no more questions, I think um, I'm going to close sacred space. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Christina, for having this event. Um, thank you for all the speakers. You've been all awesome. I'm really looking forward to Kelly later today. And um, just thank you for your patience. Blessings. <laughs>